Majora's Mask has long been considered the stepbrother game to the Ocarina of Time, a strange dark experiment that threw everything fans had come to expect into a blender, and at the center of it all stands the game's antagonist, Skull Kid. No Ganon to be seen here, no prophecies really of the Hero of Time defeating darkness, no ladies and gentlemen, here we have a forest imp possessed by an ancient mask trying to dunk the moon into the world. Welcome back to the Villainpedia, and for this video it is all about Skull Kid from The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. Before we settle in, make sure to hit that subscribe button to see more videos that are just like this. So a couple of things to establish right off the bat. Majora's Mask does not take place in Hyrule, the usual setting, but a kind of parallel world called Termina. Additionally, Skull Kid is almost a misleading title for our villain, because there are actually multiple Skull Kids. They're more of a people than they are a person. Link encountered several of them actually in the Lost Woods during the Ocarina of Time. It was a simple little interaction where you kind of play the ocarina to get a couple heart pieces. But even more notably is the one that Link plays Saria's song for, and sells a skull mask to. This is the Skull Kid who finds himself central in Majora's Mask. The Skull Kids are simple forest tricksters, and Navi suggests that they are what becomes of children that go missing in the Lost Woods. So when you first boot up Majora's Mask, Link, after plug walking through time a little bit and defeating Ganon, has gone on a personal journey to track down Navi, his fairy companion. But before we even control Link, here in the opening cutscene, he is ambushed by Skull Kid and his two fairies, Tattle and Tail. This is seemingly, in my opinion, just to rob Link, or any passerby really, opposed to Skull Kid specifically targeting him. Link gets his horse and his ocarina taken before following Skull Kid into a chasm under a tree. And right away, we can see that Skull Kid is unlike any iterations of villains in other Zelda games. He's sort of like an evil jester, a mischievous, devious little bastard who enjoys this game of cat and mouse being played. And at this point, we still have no clue what his deal is, who he is, and what's up with this mask. Once trapped underground, Skull Kid uses some crazy magic on Link and transforms him into a Deku scrub. This tree is also the portal between Hyrule and Termina, kind of like in A Nightmare Before Christmas. That's what it always reminded me of. And I mean, this is just crazy already, especially compared to the Ocarina of Time. Skull Kid's presence as the villain early on is just really strong and psychedelic and sinister and just weird. But let's break for one second and talk about these two fairies that hang around Skull Kid, Tattle and Tail. They are brother and sister. And just before the events of Majora's Mask, the two fairies were seeking shelter on a stormy day when they found Skull Kid shivering alone under a tree. They befriended him, and started to enjoy hanging out, causing mischief together as a threesome. But here early on, when Link is turned into a Deku, the fairies are separated accidentally, and Tattle is stuck with Link. This ends up being a great connection throughout the game between Skull Kid and Link. Tattle ends up helping us to track down her brother and Skull Kid, while Tails sort of stuck with him, as he continues to go crazy with the power of the mask. So, that mask then, how did some lonely little Skull Kid find such a crazy artifact? Well, later on in the clock tower, we encounter the Happy Mask Salesman, who says he can help Link return to form if he gets the ocarina back and returns the mask that Skull Kid stole from him. But he also says, hey, sorry, I gotta leave town in a couple days, so let's hurry this up. And just like that, we have an epic adventure ahead of us with the absolute strangest Nintendo villain ever out there waiting. Now with any villain, motives and deeds are key. What are they doing and why are they doing it? And with Skull Kid slash Majora, let's look at the what first. The name of the game seems to be Absolute Destruction. I mean, this seems crazy for a playful little imp guy getting a hold of an old mask, but Push quickly turns to shove for Skull Kid as he starts to get taken over by this mask and completely lose himself. So basically Skull Kid, well technically the spirit of Majora, will bring the moon down from the sky, crashing into Termina and ending the world in three days. But now let's look at the why. This is the key point where we have to separate Skull Kid from Majora. Skull Kid is actually a pretty big victim in all of this. He has no idea what he's gotten himself into, what he's doing. And the spirit of Majora is essentially just using his body and his mind to wreak havoc on Termina. So who is Majora? Well, if you ask me, Majora is the mask. Long ago, a tribe used this Majora's mask in various hexing rituals but the mask repeatedly 
caused trouble, bad luck, and violence, so it was sealed away in darkness and completely forgotten until the happy mask salesman was somehow able to track it down and add it to his collection. Majora's motives, to me, make little sense. Majora seems to be an entity of just pure chaos and hatred and insanity. Maybe all those hexes and rituals, the mask acted like a sponge and sort of soaked up a bunch of negative energy that became sentient. I don't know. There are lots of theories that have been crafted about who or what Majora initially was, a demon, a god, a sorcerer, but in-game, we have nothing really but the mask and our imagination. But either way, Skull Kid is the perfect vessel for this mask, as it easily amps up that mischief into treachery and evil. So what about Skull Kid? Is he really just an unfortunate trickster who found himself with the mask and lost control? Not quite, actually. There's a surprising amount of connective tissue here that draws all of these things together. There's a legend told by Anju's grandmother in-game that long before the events of Majora's Mask, the land of Termina was one single world, blessed by the four giants who we later used to save Termina from the moon. They were loved by all of the inhabitants of the world, but they especially befriended one, quote, imp. When the decision was made for the giants to split up and spread Termina into four regions, this imp felt betrayed and abandoned by his big ol' homies, as they were the only friends he had. His sadness quickly turned to anger, and he began tormenting all of Termina with tricks and deception. He basically became a real pain in the ass for everyone who had to live there. The people of Termina called on the giants for help, and they answered quickly. They spoke with this imp and harshly told him to get lost or they're gonna squash him. So the imp obeyed, and was now truly alone. And of course, this imp is our Skull Kid. The one who ends up with the mask, going on a spree, calling his homeboy the moon to come down real quick. So perhaps the mask sensed this outcasted soul and drew Skull Kid into finding it. So okay, that's a lot of background, and I know this has been a bit of a lore dump. But let's next just look at what we as Link do to slow him down and eventually defeat Majora slash Skull Kid. Well, when we depart from the Mask Merchant and head into Termina, we're introduced to the main mechanic of the game, and that's the three-day loop that we find ourselves stuck in as we chip away at progressing through. The moon grows closer each day, cheesing like a big ol' asshole as Doomsday is arriving. At midnight on the final day, we encounter Skull Kid again on top of the clock tower. Here we see Tail, the other fairy, kind of trying to warn Link and Tattle of the dangers of Skull Kid and what we need to do. He tips us off to the four giants in each part of the world and says that we should gather them here to help stop the moon. In a little scuffle, Skull Kid drops Link's ocarina, and Link uses the Song of Time to turn back the clock to three days prior. And thus, the loop begins. Link learns the Song of Healing to turn himself human again, and we are off to explore and prod around Termina, looking for clues on the big fellas who can apparently help out. In all the different areas we visit, we pick up other masks and meet other characters and get abilities along the way to help out. When all four giants are finally liberated, Link once again confronts Skull Kid on the final day, but this time calls in the big dudes to catch the moon. From here, things get extremely crazy and abstract and incredible. Skull Kid is knocked out. The mask detaches itself from him and buries itself in the moon. Link follows it in and we find ourselves in a field with one single tree. There are five children chilling there, and one of them is wearing the mask. They talk of playing bad guys and good guys. Now I know a lot of fan theories derive from this interaction and this line, but it's important to note that in the original Japanese dialogue, they imply someone just being it, and there being sort of a game of tag, so I personally don't read too heavily into this. But after speaking to the kids, it's eventually time for the final showdown with the physical embodiment of Majora. Now this fight is just insane. I mean, if you haven't played this game before or you don't like the time mechanic, it is all worth it just for the final 20 minutes or so of this game. It's just incredibly strange and emotional. And just, just look. But at last, at the end of it all, dawn of a new day comes, and Majora is defeated. Skull Kid is liberated, and all things are well in Termina. And this is when Skull Kid says to Link that he smells like the kid who taught him Saria's song, confirming that this is that very same Skull Kid we interacted with in the previous game. Sadly, it is time for Link to go, and we are left with an extremely heartwarming drawing on a tree stump that the Skull Kid leaves 
of Link, Skull Kid, and the Giants, and of course the fairies. Skull Kid has an incredible legacy as a villain. He's fascinating because he doesn't want to be doing any of this. He's completely used and manipulated by this ancient spirit of Majora that turns him into an absolute madman, attempting to destroy the entire world that he once inhabited. The mystery that surrounds the mask and the spirit of Majora is just still to this day so damn cool, people have no clue what the hell is truly going on. Majora's Mask is a game that is extremely niche, right? But its insane popularity just shows how high quality of an experience it really is. And for me, that's all thanks to the presence of such a memorable and unique antagonist. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Who should be in the next one? Remember to subscribe for more, and I will see you guys later. Until next time, peace.